Hello everybody, Mike Westfall here with McDonald Garden Center. Hope everybody is doing well. Today we're going to be talking about pollinator plants and products that are perfect for your garden. So really what I want to do to accomplish here in this webinar um, is of course to educate you on how to attract pollinators to your yard. Uh, they're so much fun to watch uh, and learn about and enjoy and of course they're extremely important to our environment as well as our food sources um, and they're fun for all ages and that's what I love about it is, is you know it, it's a great way to get our young kids involved in gardening but it's something that we can do throughout our entire life is, is spend time in the garden and help our local pollinators uh, today as I mentioned we're gonna talk about some of the products that we carry some of my favorites and I think what's gonna make you the most successful to get pollinators into your yard and into your garden so why do we want to attract pollinators why is it important to to have pollinators uh, it is obviously uh, uh, one of the main things is our food source so it is said that one out of every three bites of food that we eat as humans are due to pollinators. So extremely important to our food source. If you've ever grown a vegetable garden, you probably wish you had honeybees, of course, uh, and butterflies, of course. Um, and so uh, they're a great way to cross pollinate. So if you grow a tomato plant, the pollen from one flower has to actually transfer to another flower in order for you to get a fruit set. So that's how important they are. There are some plants or in some fruits, I think it's uh, cherries or maybe it's apples and almonds, um, that are exclusively pollinated by pollinators. So sometimes you get wind, right? So there are some natural pollinators, there's moths, but insects are really the most important pollinators and bees and butterflies and hummingbirds are some of the most important ones. And so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today is um, how to get them into your yard. Um, so it's a really, really good thing. It, pollinators are in a decline. And of course, it's extremely important to understand why they're in a decline. Um, you know, one is loss of habitat, of course. So that is really what we wanna support is the plants to increase that habitat, to increase an area for them to come and lay their eggs on, uh, to be a host plant or a nectar plant. And so we're gonna go through all of those details here today um, as to why that is important. And of course, using proper insect and disease controls for your plants, um, especially during those times when pollinators are out. So of course we wanna support that with our organic uh, insecticides and of course beneficial insects. I'm gonna talk about all of that here today. So you wanna stick around for that, that's gonna come towards the end. Uh, but that's a really, really important uh, part of this is making sure that we provide them the plants, but also that we're not treating our plants with things that might harm them. So really, really important. Um, so I wanna mention also that if you have any comments um, or questions while we go through this educational webinar, um, that you make those comments and I'll answer them as we go along if I can. If I don't, I'll get to them at the end. Um, how to attract pollinators to our yard is also a very important thing. So, so that's really what we wanna talk about today is how do we get them into our yard? And there's three main things that you can do, in my eyes. It's, it's uh, of course, nectar plants. We're gonna talk about all the nectar plants. Well, not all of them, there's too many to talk about. But I'm gonna talk about some of my favorite ones and the ones that if you come into our garden center, you're gonna be able to find pretty reliably. There's nectar plants plants that go throughout the season. So I mean, you know, it, you know, depending on what season you go to your garden center, you're going to find different nectar plants, whether it's spring, summer, or fall, or even winter. So there's always, when, when it's warm outside, bees, honeybees are going to be out looking for nectar. And so there's different things that you can do throughout the season. Um, of course, you know, while we're filming this, it is going to be closer to our summer time frame. So we've got more summer plants, but you can find different plants for every season. And one of my best tips for finding plants throughout the season. So if you wanna create a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden, um, and you want to attract them throughout the season, then my best recommendation is to go to your local garden center, hopefully McDonald Garden Center, and check them out throughout the seasons. And, and, and that's the most important thing is because garden centers are gonna carry plants that are blooming. So especially in perennials and annuals, we're only gonna carry those plants when they're blooming. So if you want some early spring bloomers or some fall bloomers, you're probably gonna to have to visit your garden center around that time frame. Now, some of the ones that we're gonna talk about today really bloom for a very long period of time. And then of course we mix in the shrubs and the trees and the perennials and the annuals, and you really can get a very long blooming butterfly or pollinator garden. Um, so it's really important to, to understand that. And then of course, we're gonna talk about host plants. So host plants bring uh, the, those, especially butterflies is really what we're talking about there. Bring in those, but you bring in the butterflies with the nectar plants, but then the host plants are gonna be the ones that they're gonna lay their eggs on, which is gonna help reproduce 
are pollinators, which is what we want to do. And monarchs are one of the favorite ones here in Hampton Roads, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit exclusively um, towards the end as well. Um, so let's first, and then of course, I've almost forgot, one of my favorite things are the accessories. So you can see that little bee house up there. Uh, we're going to talk, I'll show you a bee house, I'll show you, uh, I'll talk to you a lot more about how these bee houses work. Um, and there's other things that you can do, a couple tips and tricks in there when I talk about accessories, adding some different things to your pollinator garden that'll help entice those pollinators closer to your home. All right, but let's first start with nectar plants. So nectar plants, humongous list, as I was just mentioning. There are tons and tons and tons of them. Um, I'm gonna go through some of my favorites here some of the ones that I really feel like are gonna entice the pollinators the most and really probably attract the biggest range of pollinators. And what I mean by that is it could be bumblebees, it could be honeybees, it could be butterflies, monarchs, swallowtails, it could be a lot of things, even hummingbirds. So lots and lots of plants here, but these are some of my favorites, especially as we get into this warmer season. So when we celebrate National Pollinator Week here in the you know middle to end part of June, then these plants are gonna be blooming and it's a great time to support them. This is when they're out feeding. Nectar is what gives them food to survive, to, to have the energy to reproduce, and to have the energy to pollinate our plants. And so it's really, really important that we provide the nectar plants, and this is gonna be the most exciting for them to see when, and when you're trying to encourage them into your yard. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about is butterfly bush. Butterfly bush are amazing. And usually I like to start with bigger plants. If I'm planting out a pollinator garden or a butterfly garden, I'm always first gonna think about what are my big pieces? What are my big um, you know, shots of color or what are my big enticers, especially to pollinators? So what am I gonna be able to do to bring them in? And butterfly bush is an amazing one. Uh, not only is it fragrant for us to enjoy the blooms, but it's an amazing enticer for bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. And they can get a wide range of sizes too. And that's what I love about them is you can get a lot of different colors nowadays and you can get lots and lots of different sizes. So I wanna show you one that I brought in here real quick. This is our Pugster Blue. So this is a really cool bush. I know you can't quite see it, perfectly and the blooms are just coming on it which this is how I love to buy a butterfly bush or any plant really is all of these buds just ready to pop open so you can see how nice and compact this is so butterfly bush range in sizes you know a lot of them can get you know six to seven feet high and wide but some of us might not have the space maybe we're trying to create a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden that only get that's you know I've only got you know a five to six foot area that I really can devote to this um, now you can spread these around your landscape because they're amazing landscape plants as well um, but they do a great job of, of offering dwarf varieties now so this is the pugster series pugster series what's really cool about this there's dwarfs that came out a few years ago um, that just stay small and have smaller little blooms they work great and we carry them because they're a really great addition they're even great for containers but this is a great one because it offers the huge bloom that you would get on a regular butterfly bush, but on a compact plant. So these only get about two by two, three by three, and you get these massive blooms. So when these open up, these bloom spikes could be somewhere in the range of 12 to 18 inches long, which is just absolutely amazing. And all of these little tiny flowers that have loaded with nectar and just the bees and the butterflies just flock to and you'll get a lot of hummingbirds around them as well. So these are a great addition to the butterfly bush series because it offers you a different option. So if you've ever wanted a butterfly bush but you've been worried about the size, this is a great one. The Pugster series is really cool and it offers that huge bloom. Now, when we're talking about bigger plants, um, I also like to throw in a couple additions here. I'm gonna really kind of stick to some of like my five or six favorites, um, and butterfly bush is one of them. But when you're thinking about bigger plants, um, maybe you're thinking about trees. Um, crepe myrtles are a great option. Crepe myrtles will entice a lot of bees and butterflies into your yard. Vitex is another one that does really, really well in this area. Um, so there's lots and lots of options for different sizes of, of plants. And of course, I mentioned different bloom times. But butterfly bush is definitely one of my favorites. The next one is salvia. Salvias are absolutely amazing. They start in early part of spring. So around mid to early spring, they'll start blooming. They come out of the ground pretty quickly, especially if you're talking about perennial varieties, but there's annual varieties as well. They're great in containers. There are even some varieties that grow in hanging baskets now. So lots and lots of solutions here. Um, salvias are one of my favorites because it's kind of my next tier. So butterfly bush, you know, if you get a big one, might be five by five, six by six. You start to think bigger plants. 
then you start to say, okay, now I need a little bit of a mid-range size, two to three feet high. And that's why I love Salvia, because it fits that really, really nicely. And there's lots and lots of different colors. You can see here in these pictures, uh, most of them are gonna be in that blue lilac color, but there are new varieties that come out with pink blooms or white blooms. Um, so there's a huge range of colors, really, pink, white, blues, dark purples. That one that's all the way over, the farthest one over is called black and blue salvia. One of my all time favorites. Um, so salvias are a great one and they're really easy to grow. And most of them are perennial. So let's show you a couple of them real quick. Um, I've got, this is a great one here. This is kind of a different one. So I'm going to show you kind of three different kind of looks to salvia because salvia is cool like that. It's got, you know, a few different looks. So this one's called hot lips. So this is called our hot lips salvia. And this one has tiny little red flowers. They're little trumpet shapes, so you can probably just see that if I can get the plant to sit still. Little tiny trumpet shapes, great one for hummingbirds, but butterflies and bees love these as well. They can get into them. Butterflies really flock to these. Hot lips is a great one. Really kind of cool looking leaf. So it's got this little tiny leaf and it can get pretty good size. I wanna say, if I remember correctly, three by three to four by four. So let's, let me just check that and make sure. I always like to check and make sure I'm not, yep, so three by three. So that's a pretty good sized bush right there. Now it's a, it's a perennial, so it's gonna go dormant in the winter. So once all the leaves fall off and we have that cold snap, you wanna cut it back down closer to the ground. Uh, you leave it about you know maybe six to eight inches from the ground. And then each year it'll come back nice and big and full. Um, and they bloom all summer long with these little hot red blooms. Hot lip salvia is a really, really good one. And then I mentioned that black and blue salvia. So black and blue salvia is right here. See if I can pull this a little bit closer so you can see these really cool blooms. Look at that. Just absolutely amazing. It's called black and blue because it's got a black bud and then it has a blue bloom that comes out of it. So black and blue. And it's a really nice one. I love this leaf. Absolutely love it. It's got a little bit of a fuzzy texture to it, but it's really glossy too. Um, and it's just that really perfect green. I just love that perfect green to it. And it's just a really nice looking plant. And these get right about in that same range too, about three by three. I've seen them as big as four by four. You can keep them a little bit more compact because you can't actually prune these. Um, you don't have to deadhead them. You don't have to do anything. I like to just because you get this stem that's done. So let's see, I don't really have a good example on this. Well, this one's almost done. So here you got this stem right here, and this one's kind of done. So all I would do is just go in with a pair of pruners and just pick that out, or your fingers. So really, really easy one every once in a while to go and clean. And we've got lots and lots of black and blue salvia. It's one of our favorite salvias of all time. It is a really, really easy one to grow, and it gets a good size to it as well. But you might be thinking, you know, go back to that image, and you might be thinking, I'm used to that salvia up there or right next to me, and there's lots and lots of those in the perennials as well as the annuals. Um, and while these trumpet-shaped flowers of the black and blue uh, tend to attract you know, uh, insects, pollinators that have the longer, you know, proboscis, the easier way, or, or the hummingbird tongue to be able to get in there. So you can get more hummingbirds and butterflies on these. But with this guy, you get a ton of bees and butterflies. So this is probably what you're a little bit more used to. It's just this traditional salvia with this kind of tall, tall spike that has tons of little flowers that come out of it. This is our annual one. This one's called Velocity Blue. Um, really, really easy one to grow. There's lots and lots of varieties, as I mentioned, in perennial or annual form. You just always wanna check. Um, I like annual ones just because they typically stay a little bit smaller. So, or I like annual ones for container purposes. So if I'm growing a little pollinator garden in a container and I wanna be able to entice something, I need something that's a little bit more of my thriller, something that gets a little bit taller, this is a great option because it's gonna have lots and lots of blooms. It tends to kick blooms all the way from the time you plant it in the spring all the way till fall. It doesn't stop. It is a really, really good one and tons and tons of nectar. Um, but they make perennial varieties that look almost identical to this as well. And then as I mentioned, there's pink and white ones too. So salvia is a great option. Um, next one is cone flowers. So cone flowers, uh, obviously a perennial. Echinacea is what some people might call them. That's kind of the Latin name for it. 
Uh, but cone flowers are absolutely amazing. Really easy to grow, pretty drought tolerant once they're established, a really tough, durable plant. And I love cone flowers because you get a wide array of colors, you know, oranges, yellows, pinks, you even see some really dark reds. Um, so lots and lots of colors in your cone flowers. Um, and they're just lots of fun too. They make great little cut flower. Um, and I love that little spiky cone that gets on top. Uh, so for, for the seed purposes, um, it's a really, really good one. And now, I didn't mention earlier, but pollinators are, are so important to the environment. I mentioned that they're important to the environment, but you might have said why. Because they create seeds. So flowers bloom for a purpose, right? They bloom to, uh, to, to reproduce. So plants want to reproduce too. And so in order to help the plants reproduce, we need the pollinators to do that. So the pollinators move pollen from one plant to another plant while they go around and drink their nectar for their food source. So the plants produce nectar to entice the pollinators and then they transfer the pollen and then that helps them seed and then the seeds spread and seeds feed animals. Uh, there's so many different important parts of, of pollinators. It, it's just so important how vital they are to our environment and to our livelihood. Uh, but cone flowers, back to cone flowers. Cone flowers are a great one because again, good range in sizes. You know, typically some of them mostly get around 12 to 18 inches high, but you can see some that get as, as tall as 24 inches. So, you know, somewhere between that one to two foot range. So this is that kind of that next tier. Um, really, really great option. Very reliable perennial. Comes back reliably year after year. Not a lot of issues. A very tough, durable plant. Um, if you don't like the seed or if you want it to bloom a little bit heavier, you might have to go in and deadhead it throughout the season. Although I like to leave it towards the end of the season to produce seed, one, but also because I love that little cone and it's great in arrangements, especially for the fall season, uh, to use in your flower arrangements or to make a fall wreath. Uh, they really, really look cool. So cone flowers offer a lot to entice pollinators, but also a lot of enjoyment in the garden. And they're really, really easy to grow. So I've got a couple here that I wanted to show you. And I love how cone flowers kind of go through this kind of arrangement. And that's why I grabbed this one. So this one's called our Ruby Cone Flower. This is Sunny Days, Echinacea. But look at the, the arrangement of the flowers. So when they first start to come out, they've got this really cool kind of stripe on them. They got this really nice kind of look as those petals come out. And then it turns into this guy. So you start to see that center become a little bit more pronounced and you get the petals. You really get to start to see the petals. And then as the flower ages, and you've got a different stage here where you got more petals, the center is starting to kind of, you know, start to kind of open up a little bit more. And then as it gets even older, you start to get that cone, which is just so much fun to kind of just touch too. Um, but it's a really cool one, nice stem. And just look at this guy, just loaded with buds. New ones coming as low as down here. You got this brand new one coming right in here. I don't know if you can quite see that. There you go. So right here, there's a new one coming. So all the way down in here, we've got new ones coming and then all the way up to older ones that have been sitting there for a while. So really great one. The blooms last a long time. So they're gonna entice pollinators throughout this entire blooming cycle. So when they first open, they can still get some nectar. And then even when they get to this size, they can still source some nectar because that center is opening up and allowing the butterflies and bees to come and enjoy that nectar. So it's a really great one. Sometimes you'll even see just tons of bumblebees clustered around one flower. So it's a really great one. This is just a red variety or kind of that almost raspberry, kind of rose red almost. They've got yellow varieties. This one is called Sombrero Lemon Yellow. Gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And some of them don't quite get that quite as that pom-pom. So like, you know, in my images there that you saw earlier, so this pom-pom look is kind of different and kind of unique to the series. Um, but some of them are coming more like that these days. This one will get more of that cone shape. So here you go, you can look at the, the label on there. You can see as the petals kind of droop down, this center stays very, very kind of spiky and really cool and a lot of fun. Um, so we've got yellow varieties. And then of course, I love these new orange ones. So these orange ones are just really awesome. Look at those little yellow stamens in there that you can see popping out. That's where all the nectar's coming from. So really, really cool. Again, the cycle of a cone flower is awesome. Drought tolerant, easy to grow. Once they're established, you will, you'll love them. They're super, super easy. Every once in a while, you might have a little minor issue with a little bit of a fungus or a leaf spot. We'll talk about how you can treat that. Very rarely get a lot of insect issues. Most animals don't mess with it. So you typically don't have deer or um, rabbit issues with them. So really, really great one. Coneflowers, super tough, durable plant. Very easy to grow, one of my favorites. So 
That's a great one. All right, next one is zinnias. So zinnias are kind of funny. I mean, I, this is one that I really probably learned maybe about five or six years ago, how fun they are to grow, one, but also how many pollinators they really attract. You probably don't see a lot of hummingbirds coming to them, but bees and butterflies absolutely love zinnias. Now zinnias are mostly annuals, so they're gonna be something that you're gonna plant every season, but zinnias offer a ton of color, a wide, wide, wide array of color. You can see it right there, all of those colors, and so you can get mixes, you can get one single color, you can get pinks, you can get straight yellows, you can get straight reds, but they come in a huge wide array of colors, and amazingly, they offer a great platform. So it's kind of similar to that coneflower kind of size of the bloom. Uh, but that, that's what I think, that's why I think butterflies love them so much is because it's got a nice soft landing pad for them to kind of land on, and then tons of nectar. And they do great here in the summer. You know, sometimes you might experience with the fuzzy leaf a little bit of powdery mildew, but they'll kick right out of that super easy. It, it, if you don't even treat the powdery mildew, then the plant still keeps on blooming. Uh, but you can treat it very easily. I'll talk to you about that here at the end. But zinnias are a great option. They're very easy to grow from seed all the way to just installing smaller plants. So you can start them early. A lot of people get them in the little pack forms where you can get you know four or six in a pack. Um, and then you can plant them that way and watch them grow. They also have a wide range of sizes. Most of them get in that 12 to 18 inch range. Uh, but you can get some that get taller. You can get some that stay nice and short and squatty. So again, kind of mixes in that colors. You get lots and lots of colors and lots of different size options. And it's just amazing the amount of pollinators that they attract. And what's great is you can grow them in a container and they're very good container plants. So look at this guy. This is a little patio pot that we have here at the garden center. So you get this wide range of colors. I got pink, yellow, and orange all in one pot. So it's a great show. It's a lot of enjoyment for you. They actually make very, very good cut flowers for your enjoyment, but leave them on the plant and let the pollinators come flock to it because they will love these. So this one is called Zesty Mix. Um, but again, huge assortment. You can buy them in just single colors as well. So here you go, you can see that guy right here. This is just a six inch pot, and that's just a regular orange um, zinnia. And then of course you can buy these patio pots, and these do great in the landscape, they do great in containers. It's just a great option. And I'm just amazed at how many bees and butterflies just flock to it. So it's a really, really nice one. Zinnias are one of my favorites now. They're quickly becoming one of my favorites because of that. Uh, next one is Lantana, which I kind of always save for last because Lantana is one of my all-time favorites. Super, super tough, super durable, nothing messes with Lantana. I've rarely ever had problems with it. You know, once it's established, very drought tolerant. Deer, rabbits, don't mess with them. They bloom nonstop. They love it hot, so it might not bloom as profusely for you in the earlier season or the later season, but in the summer, they don't stop and you don't have to deadhead them, you don't have to do anything to them. They're just so, so easy, and they're great because they're versatile. They're, there's perennial varieties, there are lots and lots and lots of annual varieties. I love the annual varieties because it has a huge array of colors. You can grow them in hanging baskets, they can get the size of a bush, four by four, they can be as small as two by two, one by one, and even some trailing varieties. So you can see the wide range of colors. I love Lantana because that little flower, as it opens up, exposes all these other little smaller flowers, and then they actually will kind of molt or change colors. So you can see here in this example right here where it starts off kind of yellow, and then it starts to fade into the pink. Really, really cool bud, really cool bloom. You can get them in pure colors like the yellow over there, or in the orange and red colors as well. Um, so pink and yellow, orange and red, straight yellow, even purples. Uh, there's a huge assortment of lantanas and a lot of different areas that you can grow them in, which is why they make, why they make I think, one of the best pollinator plants, because no matter what space you're growing in, you can grow them. Now, let me show you a couple of them. This is some of the annual lantana. I didn't grab the perennial lantana, so here in, in the Hampton Roads area, perennial lantana, I, we think the best one, and really the only one we really probably sell as a perennial, is Miss Huff lantana. And Miss Huff lantana is one of the 
you know, proven ones that come back year after year. It looks very similar to this kind of color arrangement. Um, so you get the yellows and the oranges and the pinks all in one bloom. Uh, but there's a huge assortment of annuals and I love playing with the annual varieties. And a lot of people have success with some of these annual varieties coming back, especially this one, this purple trailing one. So this is a trailing one, which makes it great for a hanging basket, window boxes, containers, because it'll kind of spill over the side, but also amazing for borders. So if you're thinking I need something kind of low and small in my butterfly garden, I need something to kind of cover up a little bit of ground space. This one's great. This one's called Bandana Purple Falls. Really, really good one. Lots and lots of little purple flowers at the end of each long shoot. And then as you can see here, more coming. So a bunch of them coming back in here. Really, really great one. This, this is one of my favorite ones nowadays. And then this one I think is the Bandana Mango. So Bandana Mango, you can see that assortment of colors in there. Really, really nice. The yellows the pinks, and then even a little bit of orange in there as well. So nice, nice lantana, really, really easy to grow, um, as I mentioned. And this one, I think, is more of a bushy size. So let's see, uh, it gets 18 by 18. So a foot and a half by a foot and a half. Nice, bushy, stalky plant, easy to grow, can't beat it, doesn't stop blooming. And then, of course, you can grow them in hanging baskets. So I've got this hanging basket here. So easy to grow in hanging baskets, in containers, in the landscape. I've got some in my landscape that just keep coming back year after year. And I think it was an annual variety. I'm not 100% sure. But you can even get them nice and tiny and keep them in a little pot. Uh, they're very easy to grow. In a container, you're probably going to water a little bit more often. The nice thing about lantana is it'll tell you. It'll start to kind of hang a little bit. You can start to see this one's actually drying up just a little bit. So you can see these leaves starting to hang down a little bit. So the nice thing is it'll tell you, hey, I need a little bit of water. It'll start to kind of sag a little bit. But lantanas are always on the top of my list because they're easy to grow and they bloom nonstop and they attract a ton of birds uh, or hummingbirds, bees and butterflies. So for a pollinator garden, it's a must. For a hanging basket, just to enjoy, it's a must. Um, and it's just a great way to kind of help with providing that nectar. So the last thing I'll do is say, there's a lot more. There's a ton more. Black-eyed Susans are a great one. Agastache up there in the right hand corner. Um, that's a great one. And bee balm, the farthest picture over there. Bee balms are becoming super, super popular. They are super huge for pollinators, hence the name bee balm. It attracts tons and tons of bees, but butterflies love them as well. There's flocks, there's marigolds, there's, you know, as I mentioned, the crepe myrtles and the vitex. Scavola is one of my favorite annuals. That works as well. Angelonia. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's so many pollen, there's so many nectar plants that we can grow for pollinators that I, I couldn't get to all of them. It would take probably two or three hours for me just to list them all and maybe even show you a picture of each one. So, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge list. Just know that if you're planting plants and you're planting plants for butterflies, those five or six that I just talked about are great, but there's more and more and more. And as I mentioned, there's seasonality as well. Now, I know what a lot of you are probably saying or maybe thinking is I've got full sun or, or I've got a lot of shade. I don't have a lot of sun. So a lot of these plants are full sun. Some of them you can get away with a little bit more shade on them. Bee balm can take a little bit of shade. Black Eyed Susans can actually take a little bit of shade. But what I will say is plant some of your other blooming plants in the shade. There's lots and lots of options. Hostas can attract hummingbirds um, and bees alike. Um, and then of course, hydrangeas are a great source of pollen or a great source of nectar. Um, and then of course, you've got things like um, uh, let's see, uh, oh, heuchera. Heuchera is one of my favorites. So heuchera or coral bells are a great option. So no matter where you're trying to grow plants, if you've got a lot of shade, you can still grow plants for pollinators. Um, and if you are in full sun, then the world is your oyster. You've got lots and lots of options uh, to grow in full sun. Um, next, I want to talk about host plants. Now, host plants are a little bit different. Here we're getting a little bit tighter, a little bit narrower, and we're talking about butterflies. Um, but host plants are what are going to entice those butterflies to stay in your yard. So if you're trying to get the pollinators into your yard, you need nectar plants. That's going to be the way to entice them. But if you want them to stay and reproduce, and then you get to enjoy the whole life cycle, then you need host plants. And so the host plants, of course, for this area, typically are gonna be milkweed. Milkweed is what the monarch lays its eggs on, and it's the only plant that, that the monarch lays its eggs on. Now, the good thing is there's lots and lots of different styles of milkweed and butterfly weed. 
you know, very, very similar, basically the same plant, um, just slightly different. Milkweed's commonly called milkweed because it's got the milky sap, sap inside. Butterfly weed doesn't have that, but they both are basically from the same family of plants, and it's the only plant that monarchs will lay their larva on, their eggs on. And the larva, obviously, is the caterpillar that hatches that you can see all the way over in that farther picture. That's a milkweed plant with those orange and yellow blooms. I'll show you one here in a second. And then, of course, for swallowtails, it's dill, fennel, and parsley. So all of our herbs, right? So not only are they great herbs for you to cook with and grow, they're very easy to grow. You can grow them from seed. You can grow them from starter plant. Parsley really makes it through the winters here very well. Um, and a lot of times people come in and they say, I was growing such a beautiful parsley plant, it was so gorgeous, and then all of a sudden, it's gone, it disappeared. Well, that's because the swallowtails got to it, so it's a good thing. The nice thing is, parsley's gonna come right back. The dill's gonna come right back. It's not a problem. These plants are used to it. In fact, I would say that I bet these plants were designed for this. So these plants were designed to be the food source for these caterpillars because pollinators are needed for all plants. So they're giving up a little bit of their, uh, a little bit of their greenery as a food source to these caterpillars so that the pollinators can uh, continue to reproduce. So let me show you a couple of these. Um, so let's see, let's start with monarchs. So milkweed, butterfly weed, same plant, a little bit of different looks. So that's the cool thing is there's lots and lots of different looks. This is a butterfly weed. So let me pull out the milkweed just so I can show you kind of the difference here. So butterfly weed, milkweed, not a huge amount of difference. Butterfly weed comes in either an orange or a yellow bloom. So let's see, do I have another one? I think this is, these are the two that I have are the exact same variety. Uh, but butterfly weed is a little bit more of the native species that's more commonly found here in the Hampton Roads area, but it's a really, really good one. And there's a lot of other perennial varieties as well that are native to this area, like swamp milkweed, common milkweed. There's some great ones there. I'll show you those here in a second. But I think this is the biggest difference is tropical milkweed and butterfly weed. And tropical milkweed is one that you would have to plant every year, but it does attract a ton of monarchs. I will tell you, they love this one. They love to eat it up. It's another great one for containers. So if you're working in small spaces and you want to grow a milkweed to maybe support some of those caterpillars that happen to, to land on it, um, then this is a great option because the caterpillars tend to eat it up and grow very quickly. And you can see that whole life cycle very easily. And it as soon as it gets eaten up, you can see underneath here, new shoots are coming. So you've got all these new shoots coming up that are gonna produce leaves and continue to make that plant grow. But I love butterfly weed. It's also a little bit of a smaller plant. So butterfly weed only gets about you know 12 to 24 inches, right around that one to two foot range. Um, really nice, great looking blooms. So not only are these host plants for the leaves to actually feed those caterpillars, but they're also nectar plants, which makes it kind of cool. So you can have both in your yard and attract monarchs all season long. Um, let's see, but there was another one I want to show oh, you. Yeah. The swamp milkweed. Very, very popular for a wet area, hence the name Swamp Milkweed. Lots and lots of great leaves. This one will bloom. It's not blooming right now, but it blooms with that pink flower. So let's see if I can get, there you go. So a little bit of a pink bloom. Kind of looks like Joe Pie Weed a little bit, um, but really, really nice one. And this will attract a lot of them. And then the Common Milkweed, which I thought I grabbed one, yeah, is another great option. So another pink bloom. Big leaf, these actually get really, really nice and big and fat. These will spread too. So the nice thing about this one is it's spread. So if you've got an area that you can really devote to uh, monarchs and you will allow it to spread, this is a great one because this spreads throughout um, the uh, different uh, areas in your yard. And so any kind of exposed soil, this will kind of pop up in. So be prepared for that. But this is a great one if you're really trying to get into the monarch game and you really want to support all of those caterpillars, this is a really, really good one, the common milkweed. And there's lots and lots of other varieties. So there's common milkweed, swamp milkweed, uh, butterfly weed, uh, the tropical milkweed. There's a huge assortment of all of the different milkweeds and butterfly weeds out there. And so I'm sure if you're looking for one for a specific space, just ask us and we can find one specifically that fits for you. But monarchs have to have milkweed or butterfly weed. And then of course, swallowtails. Swallowtails love the parsley. So parsley is a great option. And not only is it an easy herb to grow and one that's always good to put on pretty much any dish, but the swallowtails love it. And it doesn't matter if it's the flat Italian leaf parsley or the curly parsley, they all work very, very well. And then of course, uh, dill and fennel. I think I just grabbed a fennel. So this is the bronze fennel. 
But fennel and deer, dill both have that kind of fern-like leaf, and that is what attracts the swallowtails, and they will love it. So you've got great options there to attract them. Host plants alike. Dill and fennel both get pretty good size too. So they're in that kind of 24 to 36 inch range. Uh, so they can get pretty good size. Um, and then parsley stays nice and bushy and it's super easy to grow in a container. So again, small space, big space, it doesn't matter. All right, next, po next part is how to uh, kind of make, hopefully have them kind of stay a little bit longer and kind of you know stay in your yard as long as possible that's what we're trying to accomplish here so maybe a house maybe a home so we've got these great bee houses um, and they're for mason bees i'm going to go a little bit more in depth when i show you one um, and then of course butterfly houses are a lot of fun butterflies don't really kind of you know build a nest or or have a house necessarily but what they do use these for um, is a little bit of protection so if they feel a storm coming then um then they can kind of climb inside this and protect themselves uh, from uh, uh, you know a passing storm, uh, high winds, stuff like that. They are very, very light, obviously. So having a place for them to go and shelter is a great thing. They're not going to build their home. They're not going to stay there. They're not going to you know have a family in there. They're just going to enjoy it and, and use it as a protection place. And then, of course, a water source. Water is extremely important. Now, butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds get a lot of water from their nectar, but they don't get all of their water from the nectar. So you know, have a little bit of a water source for them. You can see all the bees up there lined up on that bird bath um, drinking the water. I'm gonna show you a little quick example of how you can do that super, super easy. But having an area for them to kind of, um, you know, get a little bit of moisture is a good option as well um, to entice them into your yard. And what I love about these accessories is even if you never see a butterfly go into your butterfly house or into your bee house or into your, your bird bath, then, at least it adds a different color and texture to your butterfly garden, to your pollinator garden. So that's what I love about it. It just adds a little bit of appeal. You can put a little bit of you into it, whether it's you know taking them and making it a modern look or making it very fun and colorful. Lots and lots of different options there to kind of add a little bit of a different texture to the garden other than just you know having your, your basic plants, your nectar and host plants. So I love these bee houses. I wanna to talk to you about these because if you're growing a vegetable garden, you should definitely put one of these nearby. These are for mason bees, not carpenter bees. Carpenter bees are bad bees. Carpenter bees are the ones that you know, bore into your house and, and you know, have all those holes all over the wood. They are creating the holes in the wood. Mason bees just look for holes in the wood. They're a little bit smaller of a bee, um, but uh, they are great pollinators. And they look for these holes, and when they find a hole, they will go into it. They'll uh, kind of form their, their they'll lay their eggs there, and then they'll pack it full of mud. So typically, you're gonna find mason bees in an area where you've got maybe a, a stream or a river or you know a, a boggy area, a drainage ditch, you know, a retention pond, any of those things that might be nearby, which here in the Hampton Roads area, there's plenty of mud, trust me. There's plenty of, of water sources around that those mason bees can find mud. You just gotta give them a home. And not only is this cool to look at, but it is functional too. So here's another option. You know, and these you can put on a post. So typically you wanna put a mason bee house about three to five feet off the ground. You'd love for it to have a little bit of protection. So you want it to get some sun, but you don't want it to be blasted by sun all day long. So I love to put it on a fence that's maybe east facing or uh, 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 west facing, not south facing. South facing is all day sun. So east or west would be great. North might not be enough sun. Um, or you can put them in shrubs. You can put them on a stake. So you can just screw a stake down to the bottom. So lots and lots of versatility to these. A lot of times I'll just set them on the ground. You know, maybe put a couple bricks on the ground and even about one to two feet, I still get them. Um, so this is a great option. These are really cool. But I really want to show you this one that I showed you here first. This one's really cool because it looks like a book. So these were part of our book series that we had. But what's really neat about this is continuing the education, right? So if you got kids, this is really cool. It's got a little latch on the side and then you can pull this out. And so all of those holes have actually a visible plexiglass side here. So you can actually look and, and see how they're doing and see what they're doing. So throughout the year, you can see kind of those eggs and they're growing. So they're gonna come in here, lay their egg. They're gonna pack this full of mud to protect them. And then you can sit there and watch it. Also, what's nice about this one is it's easy to clean. So if you want to reuse this year after year, you can clean it. Not to say that you can't clean this one. All you need is a little pipe cleaner, remember those? So you just take the pipe cleaner, clean it out, wash it out at the end of the season, um, and then you put it back out. But really, really easy one. And by end of the season, um, typically they're hatching um, in the spring. 
and then they're filling them up in the summer. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a year long cycle, but it's a lot of fun to watch. And this one is a great option because it's really fun and it's easy and it's educational. And to be able to see anything as a kid, and once you see it and you believe it and you get it, this is a great option. So I love this bee house, but there's a huge assortment of them. You can build your own, you can make your own, but these are great for enticing those mason bees, which are non-aggressive bees. So if you kind of want to like, I don't really love bees that much. You know, I'm afraid of bees a little bit. I love what they do for the environment, but I'm a little bit afraid of them. Mason bees are non-aggressive, solitary bees. Um, they won't ever mess with you. So really, really good ones to entice into your yard. Um, all right, what else did we talk about? So, oh, providing a water source for your bees and butterflies, really important. One, one trick too here, and this is an easy one, it takes a little bit more maintenance, but a, a, a flat rock, like a piece of slate or just something in your butterfly garden really gives them a nice place to kind of lay out in the sun and kind of sunbathe a little bit. You know, they do want to warm up during part of the day, especially in the morning time frame. you'll see them kind of laying there with their wings expanded out, kind of soaking in the sun um, and bees uh, alike. So sometimes they need a little resting spot. So a nice flat rock is a great option. And then what you can do is you can mist it down in the morning. A lot of times you'll find morning dew on it anyways, and that's all they need to drink is just a little couple droplets. Um, so that's a great option. But this is really my favorite kind of way to provide them a water source. Is just take a saucer just like this. I'm going to try not to spill this all over the place. And all I did was just put some rocks in there. Now this is a little small. I did this just for this so I could not, you know, make a huge mess, but you can get saucers of any size. So this is just a big terracotta saucer. So you can get this, add some rocks to it. You don't have to fill the whole thing up with rocks. You only need just a couple spots for them to land on. You can spread the rocks around. You can form a little kind of mound in the center and you can do this with a bird bath. So if you've got a bird bath, bird baths, they like them, you know, birds like them about an inch to three inches deep, but butterflies and bees are going to need somewhere to sit. That's why in that image there that I showed you, um, sorry, lost my spot here. Um, that image that I showed you there of the bees, they had that, that little bit of that edge of that uh, bird bath that they were able to sit on. But just a couple rocks and a, no, and a normal bird bath really, really help because a lot of times they'll stay wet. Sometimes I'll just come through and just roll them a little bit and just turn them over. And then they've got droplets on there and then that way they can come and land there and they can drink the water right off this or they can get really close to the water source that's in there. So this is a great option, super, super easy to do. And I think it kind of looks cool. It's fun for the kids, they'll enjoy it. So this is a great way of providing a water source to your bees and butterflies. So those are some of the things that you can add as accessories. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about real quick, I'm not going to show you any examples. I don't think, it, well, I grabbed one. Maybe I'll show you one is protection plants. So the butterfly house is a great option to, uh, to have a little bit of a protection area for butterflies, but really in your landscape, if you've got a, if you've got the space to have some evergreens like a conifer, um, it's a great place for the butterflies and even the bees to go to kind of get away from it. So if they're worried about predators in the area, if there's a storm coming, they need to go somewhere and they need to hide. So conifers and broadleaf evergreens. So you can see that chindo viburnum that I used over there, you know, bigger shrubs definitely help. There's more pockets, even some of the bigger azaleas, boxwoods, hollies, those things, some of your larger evergreen shrubs are really important. They're going to know that there's safety in there and then they'll, they'll get in there and get away from any kind of predators or any kind of storms coming, but also grasses. If you ever look at um, a, uh, a, a butterfly garden kind of depiction where people kind of draw these butterfly gardens, you know, where there's different ranging sizes. There's almost always an ornamental grass in there. And you might say, why is there always an ornamental grass? Well, because butterflies love to get in here. You know, that the butterfly house, I didn't show you my package here. I've got this little butterfly kit, but the butterfly house has these slits, right? These vertical slits. And that is very similar to what you find with grass is you've got a lot of verticality that the butterflies can get in there and kind of get away. The grass will move with the storm. So a butterfly can get in here, feel very protected. And grasses, ornamental grasses, there's a huge wide range of sizes and shapes as well. Lots of beauty to them um, and lots of movement. And so they're a lot of fun for the garden, but they're also a great protection plant for your butterflies. So a really, really good one to have in a butterfly or a pollinator garden is a couple grasses, maybe a conifer, maybe put some of your larger shrubs around the area. It's a great way to kind of protect them. As I mentioned multiple times throughout this webinar, you can do this anywhere. So don't be afraid. I, I keep mentioning like these larger shrubs. You don't have to have those. 
Um, you can put a butterfly house. You know, you can build this little butterfly house and have that nearby as a little protection source. But you can do this in a large scale, which would be incorporating plants all over your landscape, right? And one of the best um, uh, kind of suggestions I would make is when you go to plant a pollinator plant, if you're doing it in a small space, let's say you've got a six by eight space that you want to do a pollinator garden, then yeah, maybe one of everything does work in that kind of space. You know, a lot of times you see these drawings of these kidney beans shaped and it's one or two or three of every plant and that's fine. But if you've got a larger landscape and we're going large here, starting on the large scale, then planting five or six or seven is really probably the better way to go. You gotta believe that these hummingbirds and these bees and these butterflies are zipping through the air and if they see one little yellow plant down there and then your neighbor has 17 yellow plants that are in this big massive pile, then where do you think they're gonna go? They're gonna go to the bigger source. So having a little bit more and does entice them. You know, especially when we get like super specific when I'm talking about hummingbirds specifically and we're trying to attract them, a big red, you know, blooming bush like that hot lip salvia is going to entice them. But if I've got seven of them and I've got the space to do it, then I'm going to get all the hummingbirds. So by adding a little bit more does entice them. And when you look at landscape design, you always want to do things in odd numbers, threes, fives, sevens, nines, because it's easier to work with odd numbers and it adds more impact. One plant can get lost. A bunch of one plants can get chaotic. But if you do a mass, then it does help. Now, some of us don't have the space for that, right? So we want to go small. You can do it small. You can do it in containers. So you can do it in a pot. In a pot, you can add all these different annuals in there. I usually like annuals in containers because, um, you know, typically perennials aren't going to come back as well in a container. Uh, you can do some, but, um, but typically I like annuals. Plus, I know that they're going to reliably bloom. So most perennials have a certain bloom time. Annuals are going to bloom from the spring all the way till the fall. So they're going to bloom a long period of time and you can get a lot of impact out of one container. And you can do it in a pot or you can do it in a hanging basket. So lots and lots of options. And if you've just got a deck and you want to make a pollinator garden on your deck, six, seven pots, bunch of hanging baskets, and you've got yourself a pollinator garden, throw some host plants on there, and you're going to have a lot of fun enjoying that. All right, next thing I want to talk about is monarchs. Real quick, I just want to go through this and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with some insect and disease issues that you might run into and how to kind of deal with those. Uh, that's a safe way for our pollinators. So monarchs, um, as I mentioned earlier, exclusively eat milkweed. Now, if you have milkweed, then that is one step. Um, but if you want to kind of get an idea or really see this life cycle, we've got a great solution for you. So in the garden center right now, we have um, a, a little bit of a, a, of a habitat that you can use. So let me pull this and show you the full screen. So well, let me show you these pictures here real quick. That butterfly over there that's on the farthest picture, that monarch is laying eggs. So you can see its tail kind of wrapped around. It's laying eggs on that milkweed. And then you can see the caterpillar is on that common milkweed eating it up um, and then you can see it's chrysalis that it's formed. So it's formed that chrysalis and then it hatches into a butterfly. So there you go, there's the whole life cycle right there. And if you want to see it, you can see it right in your own backyard, front yard, in your house. You can do this so many different ways. So we sell these habitats. These are great. This is my favorite size. We sell lots and lots of different sizes and shapes and styles. Uh, but this is one of my favorite ones. It's got three mesh sides, so it's very breathable. It's got a mesh on the top, mesh on the bottom. It does have a plastic clear side. So once this warms up, and sees a little bit of sun, it'll flatten out and it's almost like a clear window. So you can see right into it, it's a great observation window. Um, but then it's got this double zippered side, which is really, really nice. It's very, very safe. It's very soft fabric, so it's not gonna hurt them. And then what you do is you just pick out your butterfly weed or your milkweed, whatever you decide to use, and you put this in here. So you just drop that in, just like that. And then you can purchase little Monarch caterpillars. So you just take the top off of this. I got my little tiny caterpillar. I don't know if you can see it on that little leaf. There it is. So my little caterpillar. And all I got to do is just take this and just drop it right on the top surface of the soil. And then I'm just going to zip it up. And then I've got myself a nice habitat that I can watch the entire life cycle. This is so much fun for kids, but adults 
Everybody of any age will love this. It's so much fun. It's so easy to do. If you're going to do this outside, you're going to water your plant about every two to three days. Um, probably put it in a little bit of shade so the caterpillar doesn't get too hot. Um, you're going to want it uh, to, to warm up a little bit, but not warm up so much that it's just baking in full sun. If you do it inside, only water about one day, and then you want it to get as much sun as possible inside because the sun isn't going to be as bright. So inside, sunny, sunny window, um, and then water probably maybe once a week. Um, the cycle is pretty quick. So the, the, the caterpillar is going to come up. It's going to eat up pretty much this entire plant uh, just by itself, and that's okay. The plant's going to come back from that. Um, but after it eats up the plant, it's actually most likely, not all the times, but most likely it'll crawl up the sides of this mesh up to the top of your habitat and form its chrysalis on the top. So then you can take the plant out and then when it hatches out of the chrysalis, you've got a butterfly in a habitat that you can go take outside and release. And it's so much fun. It's so easy to do. And right now at the garden center, we have these available. They're super, super easy to get your hands on. Um, so we've got these um, available to you. You can buy the little monarch caterpillars and the milkweed or butterfly weed and the habitats. And it's a great kit. Um, so lots and lots of different options out there to be able to see that life cycle and experience it. These are kind of cool and new and unique as well. These little pot cover tops. So this is just a mesh top. So if you find, you know, some caterpillars growing on your milkweed outside that maybe you planted and you want to experience the life cycle, then you can cut off some of that milkweed, put it in some water, and then you've got this little hat that you can wrap right over the top. So really, really nice. Or you can just do it a different way. You can just get a pot of milkweed and buy a caterpillar and then just get one of these tops that can go right over the top of your milkweed. Do this without crushing it. And then you've got yourself a nice little observation hive right here. So super, super easy. This is a great option. Or I love the other habitat. So really, really some great examples of what you can do uh, to kind of continue that education. Great for kids, but a lot of fun for people of all ages just to enjoy in your home or anywhere. It's a lot of fun to do and it's super, super easy. So I wanted to kind of show you that because experiencing that life cycle. So I mentioned it's going to be about, you know, 10 to 14 days of eating and then it's about a week in its uh, chrysalis and then it hatches. So it's a three to four week experience. It's a lot of fun. You get a butterfly at the end of it and then you can release it into nature. There's nothing better than feeling like you're, you're giving back to your pollinator species locally. Uh, all right, so to wrap up everything, let's talk about insect and disease control. Um, I mentioned, obviously, our pollinators are in decline, so we want to always be careful about what we're using, and there's a lot of great options. That Be Safe Insect uh, three in one insect and disease control. It's an insecticide, miticide, and fungicide. So if you've got issues with your plants, especially your pollinator plants, so your nectar plants. So if you've got an issue with your zinnia or your lantana or your, your, your coneflower or something that you know is blooming right now and you know that that pollinators are on it, use that be safe three in one. That's what we'll always recommend, especially if it's blooming and pollinating right now. Or if we've got some insect issues that we've got beneficial insects that can cure. Ladybugs, great option. Praying mantis are a great option as well. Uh, even you can get white flies, or, or sorry, not white flies, green lace wings. Uh, white flies are the bad insect, but green lace wings. Um, there's lots and lots of great beneficial insects. So think organically, think beneficial insects, think this be safe three in one uh, insect and disease control. It's a great option. Um, and so it's really, really easy to do. Ladybugs are a lot of fun for kids. Ladybugs pretty much exclusively eat aphids, uh, but they'll eat a couple other things, but these are a really, really great one. So they eat aphids, spider mites, white flies, thrips, mealybugs, leafhoppers. So lots and lots of options there. And you can just see right in this bag, there's 1,500, so 1,500 ladybugs right here in this mesh bag. The best way to release them is in the evening because you don't want them all to fly away. They're very, very hungry insects. So with 1,500, if I know I've got insect issues in a couple different areas, spread these around, you know, just shake some out. Put them down in the evening, so later in the day, and then just mist down that shrub. I never tell people to water a plant on its leaves because it, it increases the chance of fungus. But just one time, not the end of the world. We're trying to help it with some beneficial insects. So just wet down that shrub, do it in the evening, drop them down at the base, knowing that you have a reliable food source, they'll come up and they'll start eating all the aphids. Once they finish eating the aphids, they'll move on to other plants into your yard or into the trees and help eat up those insects that are harming other plants. So great option. Ladybugs are a lot of fun for kids but also easy, easy, easy to do. Praying mantis are also really cool. I, I, I wish I had looked this up before I did this, um, but these have two eggs, and I can't remember how many hatch out of these eggs. 
but it is a ton. I mean, I want to say it's somewhere in like the two to 300 range. I don't know if it'll say here. Uh, da -da. Yeah, 200. I was pretty close. So 200 praying mantis out of each egg. So really, really cool because you can get tons and tons of praying mantis. Now, not every single praying mantis is going to make it in the world, unfortunately, but throughout the year, you'll see all of these bigger praying mantises eating different insects off of your plants. They're a lot of fun to watch. They're not that scary. And you might even find a couple of these eggs on some of your plants during the winter season. Leave them. Don't cut them off and then you'll get more and more praying mantises over the year. So there's beneficial insects, there's safe insecticides and fungicides. Here's that be safe three in one. So really, really great option. We carry this at the garden center. We carry it in concentrate as well as in ready to use. We carry it at all of our garden market locations. This is a great one. It's a very, very safe one. It's actually the only one that I've ever seen that actually lists safe for bees. So really, really great uh, solution there to help control some of your insect and disease issues. And so really all of those things that we can do to help pollinators are super, super important. There are obviously extremely important to us and to our environment and to the success of our plants and to our food source. So we've got to do our part in protecting them from using the correct insect and disease controls to also providing them nectar plants, host plants so they can reproduce, so that they can reproduce plants. It's a really cool cycle. Watch the monarch cycle in your home. You know, have a lot of fun with it. Big spaces, small spaces, you can do this anywhere. It's so much fun and we're here to help you here at McDonald Garden Center. So come and check us out. I hope you all enjoy this. I hope you all uh, have a great day and I hope you get to come in and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. Bye everybody, hope to see you soon.